On the 21st of January 2016, a statement was published by Reporters Without Borders and signed by various human rights and press freedom organisations, including Penn International and the International Press Institute. It concerns the case of Moroccan journalist Ali Anousla. The statement reports that, over two years on from his initial arrest, detention and subsequent release, independent journalist and editor-in-chief of the Arabic edition of news website Lacombe 2 and its block predecessor Lacombe, Ali Anousla has begun another year facing the same accusations that the Moroccan authorities have relentlessly pursued against him since September 2013. Anousla was arrested on the 17th of September 2013 for publishing an article on the website Lacombe, an independent news site that he co-founded, which contained a link to a piece about a video posted by Al-Qaeda. The link, as the Washington Post reported, attacked King Mohammed VI for presiding over a kingdom of corruption and despotism and called on youth to embrace jihad. Anousla didn't directly repost the video, but he did feature a screenshot and a link to the website of the Spanish newspaper El Pais, which carried a link to the video. In the Independence article, a Moroccan journalist stands accused of aiding terrorism. They state that he reported on the video link entitled, For the first time, Al-Qaeda attacks King Mohammed VI which criticised the wealth of the extravagant king, who flew his Aston Martin 1,300 miles to get repaired. Though a newsletter only published an indirect link to the video, it called for an uprising. The next day, the general prosecutor, under the new terrorism laws, charged him with assisting, advocating and inciting terrorism. A newsletter is described as one of the most respected Arab journalists in the region, he is known for his commitment to promoting independent newspapers as well as his steadfast dedication to press freedom, including a bold editorial stance that does not hesitate to cross red lines and criticise the authorities, as stated by Reporters Without Borders. Throughout 2014 and 2015, Anousla faced the prospect of appearing before various investigating judges accused of the same terrorism-related charges that he continues to face, only to have his hearings repeatedly postponed. As a report in Middle East Eye titled A Free Press in Morocco, Up to a Point, Lord Copper, makes clear, Anousla and his supporters do not accept the reason for his arrest. According to a senior member of the Moroccan Association of Human Rights, he wasn't arrested because of Al-Qaeda, it's because of what he'd been writing for months about the monarch. In the months preceding his arrest, the Middle East Eye report explains, Anousla's work included a report on the country's corrupt sand quarry business Editorials that question the size of the monarch's budget, reported at $851,000 per day, and the frequency of his vacations. And, most controversially, a newsletter reported that the king took part in a deal with Spanish King Juan Carlos to pardon Daniel Fino Galvin, a Spanish citizen condemned to 30 years for the rape of 11 Moroccan children between 4 and 15 years old, many of whom he filmed. Following Anousla's expose, the king reversed his decision and Galvin was rearrested in Spain a month later. Anousla told the Middle East Eye, I was in jail for other issues, not terrorism. Anousla is not alone. Another prominent case making headlines is that of Moroccan professor Monjib, one of the founders of an association called Freedom Now that defends the freedom of Moroccan journalists. As the Huffington Post reports in its article, Maati Monjib, The Cost of Free Speech in Morocco, since setting up Freedom Now, he has faced a disgraceful campaign of personal and political defamation, including a number of shifting allegations. First, he was wanted for threatening state security, then working for foreign agendas and destabilizing citizens' allegiance to Morocco. In September 2015, he was denied the right to leave the country to attend an academic conference in Spain. He began hunger strike and the government campaign against him intensified. He was accused of corruption and financial irregularities. In October, he was prevented from leaving the country again in order to attend a conference in Norway. After eight days without food, he collapsed and was hospitalised. He suspended the hunger strike, only to be met with further allegations of receiving foreign funds to diminish the credibility of Moroccan institutions. And these are far from isolated incidents. The Guardian reports on the case of a Moroccan investigative journalist released after 10 months in jail. This is referring to Hicham Mansouri, a journalist who had been working on a piece about electronic surveillance by the state when he was arrested. Then, his charges were for adultery, formerly still illegal in Morocco, but a law that is rarely enforced. Now, the article reports, he is among seven activists and journalists 
facing trial for charges that span from threats to national security to failure to report foreign subsidies. A Financial Times piece, Spectre of ISIS Used to Erode Rights in Morocco, cites a report from Freedom House, a Washington-based advocacy group, which states that the Moroccan government's promised campaign to expand press freedom languished in 2013 as proposed reform legislation failed to be finalised over the course of the year. Unofficial but clear restrictions remain in place, discouraging coverage of politically and socially sensitive subjects, while restrictive laws continue to be used to clamp down on journalists and news sources. The FT article reports that activists in Morocco say that on the country's most critical issues, the space for public debate has become more constricted. Debate over the country's costly annexation of Western Sahara, which the UN refuses to recognise and is at the root of the decades-long dispute with neighbouring oil giant Algeria, remains a red line. Freedom House reports that blogger and journalist Mustafa al-Haznawi, a known advocate for the rights of incarcerated members of the Islamic movement, was arrested in May 2013. In July, he was sentenced to a four-year jail term on terrorism charges, although the sentence was reduced on appeal to three years in October. The Arabic Network for Human Rights Information condemned his incarceration, asserting that he had been punished for defending human rights and criticising the government. He remained in prison throughout 2014. And such restrictions don't only apply to Morocco's own journalists. Middle East Eye reported that foreign journalists have difficulties too. In 2011, Moroccan authorities rescinded accreditation for all Al Jazeera journalists in the country following the outlet's coverage of Western Sahara. A Spanish daily was banned twice in 2012 for publishing a cartoon of the king and coverage of a book that was critical of him. Nor is the lack of press freedom in Morocco a new story in itself. The intensity of crackdowns has ebbed and flowed since King Mohammed VI took the throne in 1999. However, as the Middle East Eye Report explains, there are also consistent indirect methods through which the media is controlled. Either individual journalists are charged with crimes related to their professional or personal lives, dragging their names and credibility publicly through mud, or advertisers, who rely on the king's permission to run their businesses, are pressured to pull their money from publications that report red line crossing news, thus making it difficult for the outlets to survive financially. What is most notable about the current restriction of press freedoms is that they come in the wake of promised reforms and even legislation that has yet to be properly and consistently implemented. The Freedom House report states that Morocco's 2011 constitution guarantees freedom of the press, but its vague language enables great latitude for interpretation and hinders enforcement of media protections. On February 20, 2011, when unrest across the Middle East began to topple governing regimes, Morocco saw its own protests in the form of the February 20th movement. Unlike those who fell, the Moroccan regime realised the need to defuse tensions and appear to be receptive to the people's demands. A programme of reforms was announced in July 2011, and as the BBC reported at the time, the King pledged that the reforms will reinforce the independence of the judiciary, boost efforts to tackle corruption, guarantee freedom of expression and gender rights, and make Berber an official language alongside Arabic. The reforms succeeded in easing opposition forces, and the protests died down. Many were optimistic about this new era of reform and the commitment to democracy they perceived in the proposals. Many have since seen that such reforms were not intended to weaken the king's power. He remains the head of the armed forces. He also retains the power to appoint the Prime Minister of Parliament, as well as the power to dissolve Parliament after consultations with the new Constitutional Court, half of whose members he would have appointed. The Western Sahara, most of which has been under Moroccan occupation since 1976, remains occupied by Moroccan forces. The Polisario Front, which fights for indigenous independence and self-determination, waged a guerrilla war against the Moroccan forces until a UN-enforced ceasefire was declared in 1991. The Guardian notes in its report on the forgotten occupation that UN diplomatic efforts have achieved nothing despite 10 rounds of informal talks. It goes on to report that in Western Sahara, police regularly block public gatherings organised by opponents of Moroccan rule. Activists are routinely detained and tried in military courts. Reporting on such events in the Western Sahara remains a red line issue that cannot be touched by the press. Given Morocco's dire record on press freedom and its continued military presence, maintaining what The Guardian referred to as Africa's last colony, 
it may come as a surprise that Morocco is a key ally to the US in the region. Perhaps this explains why most of the news stories covering the country's worst practices come from outlets in the Middle East and human rights groups, and rarely from the Western press. A telling piece this week from a former US ambassador to Morocco in the Huffington Post makes such alliances clear. Morocco's dependable friendship warrants American gratitude and support. He does not ignore the uncomfortable issue of the Western Sahara. Rather, he takes the issue head on, congratulating Congress for mandating that US aid to Morocco be spent, in part, in Morocco's Western Sahara region, referring to Morocco's responsible stewardship and its peacefully integrating the Western Sahara into its economy and providing new, important political and entrepreneurial liberties to its indigenous population. There is, of course, no mention of the circumstances under which Morocco became Western Sahara's steward, nor of the consequences for journalists such as Alain Rabet, who attempt to criticise such stewardship, nor the seven journalists, including Hicham Mansouri, due to go on trial this month.